Hey everybody, it's Tom at MTG Spec. Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about the sheer genius of action comics and detective comics and how it relates to the longevity of Magic the Gathering. Uh, here we have Action Comics number one. Um, sometime last year, I believe, uh, a graded copy of this sold for $3.25 million. Um, just about a week or two ago, a Superman number one sold for like $2.6 million, something like that. Um, so obviously incredibly influential, impactful uh, first appearance of Superman. But did you know that this issue also has the adventures of Chuck Dawson, Zatara, South Sea Strategy, a two-page story in which Brett Cole and his first mate Cotton Ball help Samuel Newton out of the water. All right. Sticky Mitt Simpson, um, a four-page comic strip about Simpson who steals or attempts to steal an apple and is chased by police for the next four pages as he tries all kinds of ways to fool them. I mean, this is depressionary. You know, stealing apples is kind of a big deal. Avengers of Marco Polo, Pep Morgan. He's the light heavyweight champion. Scoop Scanlon, a jewel thief with his partner Rusty James. Tex Thompson. Stardust, a one-page feature about different actors. Odds and Ends, a one-page feature about professional athletes. Um, I mean, obviously, they were throwing spaghetti at the wall and Superman stuck. But believe me, they continued all these weirdo, like, backing, like, stuff like PT, Boat Skipper, whatever. All these guys, like, continued to, to be backup features for Superman. Detective Comics, number one, wasn't as lucky. First of all, that's a very unfortunate cover. Um, but some of these adventures are kind of funny. The Murders of Captain Scum, the Rangara Pearls, the Peruvian Mine Murders, Claws of the Red Dragon, the Gatlas Jewels. I like this one. This is uh, Gus keep, Gumshoe Gus keeps an eye out for Mrs. Gottlieb's jewels, only to see them stolen by someone he eventually bops on the noggin. I mean, with their bopping on the noggin, that should have been in action comics, honestly. The Barlinoff case. Uh, this... This is sort of interesting because it's written by Siegel, Jerry Siegel and inked by Joe Schuster. So the same creative team that brought a Superman in, in issue one um, of Action Comics also worked on Detective Comics number one. That's an interesting little bit of trivia. But then there's Silly Sleuths. So not only is it Detective Comics, but within that you have a panel of one, uh, one panel jokes or a, a collection of one panel jokes, the Bar S Rustlers, Cattle Thieves. So you have Western so they had jokes, they had Western, but all with under Detective Comics. And then The Streets of Chinatown, um, which was, uh, is this Slam? Yeah, Slam Bradley, who um, is a recurring detective character. So before Batman rolled out, like this is 26 issues before Batman even existed. Um, but you can kind of see the stuff they're throwing at the wall. But after Batman came out, they continued to again, produce these backup features. And what's brilliant about that is when you just choose a genre like action or detective, you can, you can sort of do AB testing on all these characters and see which ones hit it. And the same thing is true of magic, the gathering. You look at the card game called magic, the gathering at this point, you know, magic doesn't just mean fantasy. Um, Cause you have uh reskinned, or repurpose things where you have the walking dead, which is sort of modern horror. You have upcoming Warhammer 40 K and infinity, which are both squarely in the science fiction category. No magic involved really. I mean, I guess Warhammer 40 K may have some magic, but you know, it, it, it still shows that their definition of magic is just anything that's not really possible. And that is a great place to be in, in terms of creative space. I recently did a video called MetaZoo Will Fail and got a lot of uh, negative feedback, a lot of, you know, thought out feedback. So I appreciate everyone's comments on that one. But I was, I was, it got me thinking about how magic could literally like, you know, do a, a secret layer where they, they, they wear MetaZoo's skin and shamble around in its place. And have reskinned cards that are, you know, because Magic already has like Yetis, it has Chupacabra. They could reskin those things to be all the MetaZoo things. You could have some Amfin character play the Leveling Frogman, but could they? Could the reverse be true? And when you look at the 
CCGs um, that have longevity, even something like Dice Masters. Like I literally have a Dice Master set that was um, them doing Yu-Gi-Oh. They did D&D. So Dice Masters, you know, has done multiple other properties. They do Marvel. They do DC. Uh, Magic is getting to that point now where they're, you know, they can do whatever they want. Yu-Gi-Oh is in a similar place just by nature of Yu-Gi-Oh. Yu-Gi-Oh is a card game about a card game. So it li- exists on some meta level of reality where they don't have to pick a genre. And if you look at Yu-Gi-Oh cards, the the sheer variety of themes and flavors, you can have a little jigglypuff looking marshmallow dude existing in the same universe as some like truly sinister looking super demon and then that can coexist with like wrestling or formula one racing like they have no genre and that's part of the genius of Yu-Gi-Oh in a way and then look at the other games like you have Vice Schwartz which is literally just whatever anime wants to let their license be used so you have everything from Goblin Slayer to uh, the Ruby set just came out RWBY the the four girls or whatever um, so, you know, you, you can have all kinds of different, uh, attack on Titan they did. So any anime can fit under that umbrella. The, all these properties cat, like have a very large tent to exist within. Um, trying to think what was the other one? Oh, universes, uh, UFS, uh, later became universes and they've had, you know, everything from dark stalkers to street fighter to cowboy bebop, to king of fighters. You know, a lot of any kind of fighting game, but now they've also done My Hero Academia, so they're they're treading into the the manga tori, uh, manga and anime territory as well. Um, so you know, when you look at these type of games, even Force of Will um, last year they did a kind of unimpressive, uh, but still kind of cool looking Ghost in the Shell, where they they did the Ghost in the Shell TV show. And the reason I, I say that was unimpressive is they had the mechanics there. But, and, you know, Force of Will basically has the five colors of magic or the equivalent. In this case, it's almost like everything was an artifact. They had one, one piece of, or like one colorless thing on the color dial. So they didn't really express the game um, in the way magic would, where they would just go, oh, Negan from The Walking Dead? Well, he's obviously uh, what Mardu colors. So let's just run with that. It, he's black, black, red, white. Let's go with that. It was, it was almost like they were just like, oh, yeah, everything's colorless or an artifact, you know, or that was the equivalent thinking. But even they, you know, had the this, the type of system in place where they can do multiple things. And I think that's one of the things that could hurt MetaZoo long term uh, is that they are very specific to cryptids. That being said, if you look at Pokemon, Pokemon doesn't give a damn about any kind of mythology uh, that I can tell. Like they have different trainers, they have different gyms. I guess there there's some sort of story involved, but they really don't mess with the story much. They just repackage the same characters. They they'll introduce a few more if they have to. You know, I remember back in the day I could name the original 151. I don't even know how many there are now. Probably eight, nine hundred, a thousand. Um, so they they slowly trickle out some new ones. And you know, this one has leak slap. This one has whatever, you know, Waddle. I don't know. They have the like weird powers, but Pokemon is a good business model for MetaZoo where like just get used to the same things over and over, but with cooler, different foiling. And, you know, you'll have some longevity there, but you know, the games that really stood the test of time, you know, there are games that I consider to who have to have been successful. One of the main ones I would say is uh, the decipher star Wars card game. Because that one, they they basically meticulously extracted all the different characters and little plots and nuances from the original six movies. And they even got into episode one before Lucasfilm li- yanked the license out from them. But they, they explored the entire original trilogy to to the, the smallest nugget of, of, go- of goodness. And that was a game that lasted a long time. And once you've once you are doing some sort of game based on a, a property like Star Trek, Star Wars, once you do that first scrub through, then you're sort of back to basics. And 
you have to find like themes and stuff like that to go with. And it's never as good after that. Like once you've done that original run where you introduce all the characters and all the situations that are familiar, the, the, uh, let's go back and, you know, kind of plumb the depths one more time. It never works as well. And I'm worried about that with MetaZoo. And, um, another thing, uh, Jihad. Okay. So Jihad, the, or which became Vampire the Masquerade or Vampire, uh, the, I don't know, Vampire the, the Killing. Um, the vampire game, like it's sort of, it tried to do what I'm afraid MetaZoo is going to try to do, which is go international because MetaZoo, you know, they, once they run out of us cryptids, you know, yes, they can go around the world. But if you look at like the sales slump that vampire got into with like the set where it was like all set in Africa or whatever, like, it's just, it's not something that there's a big appetite for with us fans. Um, the, the whole international aspect. I mean, it'd be cool to like see some MetaZoo leprechauns or whatever in Ireland or, you know, what, whatever they, whatever they can do, um, it's going to be interesting, but I think they, they are on a ticking clock right now, uh, creatively. And I don't really know how they get around it. And the reason is goes back to action comics, goes back to detective comics. Uh, cryptids isn't a genre. It's a little more specific than that. Um, fantasy would be a genre, you know, like monsters would be a genre. Cryptids is very specific to local color, local flair. And, um, you know, it's one of the reasons that magic has been so successful and is going to continue to broaden its tent in the future. Anyway, that's my rant for today. Hope everybody had a great Christmas. Um, and we're looking forward to a really good new year too. So I hope everybody's having a great day. We'll talk to you later. Okay. Bye.